ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome in on a Monday night. Hey, I be fresh as hell rocking Prada, hopping out the PJ with a model. Okay, understand something about what 21 Savage was telling us. We're talking about rich folks shit tonight. We are talking about, I'm talking about having millions and somehow hitting the lottery rich. I'm talking about don't ask the price tags. Matter of fact, give me two of them type of rich. I'm talking about, Having Jamon Dumas Johnson and Smile Mondon, EJ Lightsey, and the boys on roster signing Troy Bowles, CJ Allen, and Raylan Wilson in 2023, and then turning around in 2024, committing Justin Williams, the number one linebacker in America. That's the type of rich I'm talking about today. I'm talking about being the richest in the building and hitting the lottery. That's what it feels like Glenn Schumann and the University of Georgia did today as they land the commitment of Justin Williams out of Conroe, Texas, out there at Oak Ridge High School. Obviously, we had his teammate Joseph Ajonye on the channel uh, to make his official commitment a couple weeks back. And he kind of teased, you know, Justin Williams, my uh, teammate, part of the reason, you know, one of the guys that impacted my recruitment throughout this process. So we had a little bit of a teaser on the channel, but we didn't quite have the the breaking news on the channel shout out to on three for getting that commitment announcement over there um hey it's a competitive business right but hey let's talk a little bit about justin williams today obviously you're here for the reaction as well as mbr we are going to watch a little film today excited to do that with you um here in the home studios let's talk about justin williams six foot two 205 pounds which might sound light um but he has the frame and the ability certainly to add on the required weight I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, in fact, some like some offensive linemen, I'd rather you be heavy. Like we're going to run the piss out of you anyway. So any of your baby fat, we're going to lose. When it comes to putting on quality, high quality muscle um, in the areas in which we need you to put it on, I would prefer that to be done by a college strength and conditioning coordinator, not necessarily a high school coordinator. Not saying that they can't do that, um, but hey, if we're going to put on 20 pounds, let's make sure we're doing it the right way, and our college football program will make sure that happens. I don't worry about any type of additional uh, weight needed to be added to the frame. Some people will look at the profile and think that might be the case. Uh, this is a 444 verified runner, okay? This is a burner. The tape says he is. He's an 11-second flat guy in the 100 and the pads are plenty loud for a 200. Somehow we got muted there. Um, make sure we got make sure we got some good audio checks here. Anyways, this is a, a guy that's six foot two, 205 pounds that can absolutely burn um, and, and, and can straight up roll. He one thing you're going to see about the film that I, I love. OK, particularly because nowadays these inside linebackers that most people are recruiting, right, particularly Georgia, you're talking about linebackers that are more space players in high school. Um, if you look at tape like Raylan Wilson's, he's playing a traditional inside linebacker. But if you turn on like Jalen Walker's tape, that dude's playing almost like an edge rushing position. You turn on to Marcus Riddick's highlight tape right now in high school, the, the current commit that might not end up being one. You're going to see a guy playing a lot on the edge. A lot of these traditional inside linebackers nowadays – are getting after the quarterback in high school. They're playing out on the edge. This is not one of those. The tape we're going to show you is from a traditional Mike position, okay, whereas some of the guys that they're recruiting in this class take a uh, Chris Cole, for example, or a Christopher Jones that we've interviewed on this channel. That's a Willie, right? That's a Quay Walker type of position. That's, a, uh, I think, more of a Smile Mondon type of position. That's more of a Jalen Walker type of position. I think Justin Williams – matches the physical profile and the film profile of that of a traditional Mike, though he has the skill sets of being that Willie that we're talking about on the channel. So excited to show you this here tape tonight. Um, we'll get after it here in just a second after I get it nice and set up. But a massive uh, addition for the Georgia Bulldogs today. Obviously, they beat out Oregon and Dan Lanning um, for that commitment of Justin Williams. 
Uh, he said on, on the stream that we watched today that he made the decision a couple weeks back. Um, it's it's kind of been a Georgia lean for a little while. The Majiggy don't miss, all right? Just for those of you who don't already know, that Majiggy never, ever misses. So make sure you're paying attention over there on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin, if you want to know the deets over there. All right, without further ado, let's file or let's uh, present this screen share for you guys so we can watch this here tape. Again, Justin Williams Jr. tape here. We're going to talk to it a little bit. Here's what I want you to notice off rip, okay? The only negative thing I will say about Justin, we've done this on the channel already. We've already watched this tape in previous weeks. The only, if you will, negative. He can be a little bit nosy upon contact, okay? When we're watching him, you will notice that his nose extends out in front of his feet. It's, it's okay. It shows aggressive tendencies, but it's also something that leads to missed tackles when we get to the next level. We want to play chest up, eyes up, and, and, and sink at the hips and explode through and up through the ball carrier, not necessarily nosy. You'll see what I'm talking about very quickly here on the tape. Let's shut up and let's grind this here tape. I hope you guys can see that. Y'all can't. Let's add it to the stream. Boom. There we go. You know, we are uh, doing a little something over here in the studio. So things look and feel and sound just a little bit different. When we get back from vacation after August 1st, um, August 7th, you guys should see uh, all the things we've been working on here. Let's watch this tape right here. You're going to see, like I said, this traditional mic evaluation, but you're also going to see this 11 second hundred real quick right here. Hey, what I want you to see, we talk about knee drive on this channel. I think I'm the only person that really talks about it uh, adamantly, particularly when we're, we're, when we're evaluating football players. Not a ton of knee drive here, but we don't see it a ton in traditional linebackers. You want to see the difference between a linebacker that runs 4-4 and a guy like Justice Haynes who runs a 4-4 at the running back position. Check the knee drive. It's right there every single time, right? the it, It's just a, a minor differences in the hip tightness. That's all that is right there. Love watching the traditional mic tape and love, like I said earlier, the power in the pads. I don't care if you're 205. If you show up and you're loud on tape, if you are as explosive on tape as you are supposed to be like that right there, if you're putting Texas high school offensive guards on their butt on power, dude, you got power in your pads. You've got shock in your pads. You've got thunder upon your arrival when you make contact. That's all you need to know about a 205-pound linebacker, really. We don't have to sit here and say, hey, but he's light in the pads. It doesn't really matter as long as he's explosive with what he's got on his frame currently. Great reader and instinctual football player as well. I love watching him slip tackles or slip blocks right there, right? The, the, the tight end right here, I believe it is, is down blocking up to the second level. His job is to take the mic and run him this way. It's a great job slipping up underneath that uh, blocker and then getting proceeding to get flat right here. Boom, get flat and making the play in the backfield right there. Oh, you got to love special teams. Kirby Smart, if you're going to play at the University of Georgia, you better be ready to play special teams. I don't care if you're a five-star. I don't care if you're a 12-star. You're going to play special teams at the University of Georgia. Got to love seeing that on the clips as well. Ah, the scraping. Yes, sir. Arrival violence. This is what college football looks like now, right? Hey, you not only have to take on guards like we saw him do, hey, plug in B-gap, shock, violent, right? But, hey, we also play wide zone football teams where you might have to make a play at plus two, right? Right here, plus two on the sideline, which means we've got to be able to scrape with our shoulder square, shoulder square, shoulder square, arrive violent, boom, head on the play side of the, the ball carrier. That's tremendous right there from Justin Williams. I love the play recognition. Hey, we notice H-back scat, right? We notice H-back motion. We're bringing the H-back into the uh, formation. Film tells me, hey, they might be running inside zone, stretch zone my way. Boom, let's key now. Let's beat the ball carrier to it. I love watching these little subtleties. Boom, watch the hands stick out right here. Hey, watch it, watch it, watch it. We see Georgia linebackers doing this on tape all day when we watch film on the dogs the last couple of years, last several years under Glenn Schumann. Play identification is key, not just being physically gifted like this young man. And he certainly is, man. Like we told you, 6'2", 205, verified 4'4 runner. This dude can get after it, man. I want to I want to wait. Good God, the acceleration right there. Get into the alley and stick your foot in the gas, right? Hey, we have found the alleyway right now. Time to close space. Let's get after it. Boom. Get our head on the play side. Love it. Love the energy he plays with as well. 
We got to get to one clip here. He gets cut on one of these, or someone attempts to cut him. He puts his hands down and pops right back up and makes a violent, violent play on the sideline. I think it's this right here. God, my brain works so weird. This is the play. Yep, boom. Gets cut, puts his hands down, foof, rides violent. This is it, man. This is your indies. This is what it looks like, your individual period. Coach going to roll that goofy-ass bozu ball at you. You're going to have to put your hands down on him, and then we're going to have to reset our feet, jump over the trash, arrive violent, stick our head across him. Pow! That's it, man. That's playing football. That's what it looks like at the college level. That is a baller, son, an absolute baller. And I loved listening to his quotes about, you know, hey, don't really, don't really care what the room looks like. Honestly, it, it's what I need. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like – the, the guys that look at this depth chart nowadays at the linebacker position, and if they're scared off by the competition, they probably wouldn't have survived at that position anyways. It is so, so highly contested for playing time that if you're someone that just wants to walk in and be guaranteed playing time, that, that's probably not the school for you. In fact, it's not probably not the school for you. It's not the school for you. So that brings Georgia to 26 commits in the 2024 class with uh, – you know, Demarcus Riddick set to make a, a final decision. This one's weird, guys. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been covering Georgia for four years now, five years now, whatever it is. We've covered a lot of high school prospects, covered a lot of commitments. I've never seen a current commit have a commitment decision. I'm telling you right now, it probably means he's not coming to Georgia. I mean, if you were coming to Georgia, you just wouldn't have a decision to be made. The decision is made. You know what I mean? So Auburn and Alabama look to be – battling out there for that, uh, you know, commitment in, in terms of DeMarcus Riddick this week. Um, and then there's a couple of other linebackers that are still on the board. You know, midway through the summer, I thought Georgia was looking at a board that looked like Sammy Brown, uh, Justin Williams, and Joe Phillips, right? Well, they got one of those three. Joe Phillips obviously committed to Auburn, and Sammy Brown went to Clemson. And, and now the board, not to say these guys weren't priorities, but now the board kind of looks like, letting DeMarcus Riddick walk and, 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 you know, landing Justin Williams. And then you got room left to add and, and, and work left to be done with guys like Christopher Jones, um, the, the linebacker out of Virginia that we've interviewed here. And, and you've got some work to do with a guy like Chris Cole, linebacker out of the Midwest. So you've got some options. But I, it, it, when we looked at it in June and, and in February, or not even in June, when we looked at it in May, we were like, good Lord, how is Glenn Schumann going to sign a couple of five stars and a borderline guy in Joe Phillips, who I thought was like, yeah, one of them. How's he going to do this after signing the 2023 class? And you know what? It don't really matter. You got the number one linebacker in America to agree to come compete in that room. I think that says, you know, not that you needed any more verified proof of Dan Lanning, or excuse me, Glenn Schumann, but you got it today. Welcome into tonight's show. Hope you hit that thumbs up button. Hope you hit that like button. I know we're 18 minutes in and I just now asked for your support. But we got a loaded show for you guys tonight. And it looks like we've got a pretty large crowd watching us here tonight. Hope you enjoyed our SEC Media Day coverage. We're going to give you our final reactions from the SEC Media Days um, today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the NFL running back market and how I think, and I don't think, I know it's going to start to impact the college football ranks um, in terms of NIL packaging for running backs. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight as well. So make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. Make sure you're hitting that like. Make sure you're coming back, man. I'm telling you, we're going to we're gonna have a show tomorrow night. We're going to have a show Thursday, as usual. We've been promising you Monday, Tuesday, Thursday on this platform all offseason. But the offseason is no longer, okay? SEC Media Days hit this week um, and, or last week, and I'm going to take a, a brief vacation next week. And when we come back, August 7th, okay, I have – we've gone through a lot of iterations of this channel. I'm going to be honest with you, a lot. We had the iteration where I was standing in front of that ugly Sports Illustrated background. Um, no offense to my employers. It just wasn't that great, all right? We went from uh, using one of these little baby mics to using a sure mic. We went from, you know, being in uh, a garage with a couple of backboards and back plates and, and, and things that we've created. And we have grown and continued to grow on this channel. I, I haven't done anything like I'm fitting to do. And like we're fitting to do on this channel. And in fact, I would venture to say in this market for what we are, I don't think anyone's ever done what we're about to do come August 7th. So I'm extremely proud um, and extremely excited. In fact, I'm staring at it right now. 
Um, it's been really, really hard to sit here in this old setup, continuing to do the show the way we've been doing it for years while looking at what is essentially my dream. My dream has been uh, to create a TV studio worth calling a TV studio um, since I started this business and to do it in my home, to build it in my basement so that I could still remain the father and the husband that I want to be while remaining a maniac on this channel and producing this content for you. So August 7th, not only are we debuting Aaron Murray every Monday, not only are we bringing you Terrence Edwards every Tuesday, but we are also going live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, not just one hour, but two. Okay, for years, you've gotten me whenever you've gotten me. You've gotten me this offseason, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for a singular hour every night at 9 o'clock. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, starting this fall, August 7th, you will get this platform, okay, for two hours a night, four nights a week. I promise you that right now, and it'll look and sound far more different than you probably ever thought this place would ever do it, and it's a, uh, a testament to you guys. So I'm very, very happy, very, very proud um, to bring you what I'm going to bring you uh, Monday, August 7th. So we'll see you then. Um, but until then, we got some loaded shows for you guys here tonight. Man, I'm super juiced. It was SEC Media Days this past week. There are some main takeaways. We gave you a lot of coverage up there in Nashville. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, got my boy Kirby on. Got my boy Jay Will on. Got actually D Kirby, Kirby Smart on the program as well. Um, so, yeah, if you didn't check out any of our Nashville content, please feel free to do so. But I do have some final takeaways, and these aren't your normal takeaways. I'm not going to sit here and rank quarterbacks. I'm not going to sit here and give you my SEC West predictions, even though we could have done that. We certainly could have mailed in the content today, not claiming that the rest of you guys doing that type of content or mailing it in, but you know what you're doing. Nice and easy for you. We're going to bring you a rant today um, in the form of some interesting titles, like Coach I Would Most Want to Play For. OK, I obviously would pick Kirby Smart here or Nick Saban. I think those are too easy. Um, I think the the harder one is to say, hey, which of those guys, you know, not those two guys would you want to play for? And I think the answer is, is easy for me. Um, it's Shane Beamer. I find that Shane Beamer is tremendously refreshing at uh, from a positivity standpoint. If you watched SEC Media Days, you would have heard me ask Shane Beamer a question about the fact that he and Sam Pittman are the only two coaches in the SEC that have no extensive coordinating backgrounds as an offense or defensive coordinator. This is fact. This is true. It does create uh, things that you have to overcome, like the fact that you don't have an extensive offensive or defensive background. So when things go awry, you don't necessarily have anything to lean back on. Oh, and you have to hire extremely well. There are certainly detriments to not having been a lifelong coordinator. This is obvious. But instead of answering that question with that answer, uh, not necessarily a pessimistic answer, but a realist answer, he gave me a very optimistic answer. And he did so with a tone in which people might have thought he was offended by the question. But he probably was. It's probably a question that he's gotten asked a ton, particularly in interviews, like for the job that he's got at South Carolina. Probably the first thing they asked him, hey, you've never been a coordinator. What are, what are we going to do? And you know what he did? He spun it into an answer of, you know, I actually think it's been a, a positive thing in my career because unlike an offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator, as a special teams coordinator, I've stood up and I've addressed the entire football team. To an extent, true. 100%. To an, well, not 100%. I'd say about 90%. Uh, true. But, I mean, in reality, you're not really talking to the offensive linemen in the special teams meeting room unless all of them are on the field goal unit. But, nonetheless, the point remains – his ability to remain positive at all times, to me, would have been an invaluable asset and an invaluable uh, uh, selling point for me as a young man. I think when we're in our developmental years as men from 18 to 23, what type of role model, what type of man we surround ourselves with is beyond vital, okay, beyond vital. Um, and surrounding ourselves with someone who never allows themselves to be negative or never allows themselves to say negative things and always looks for the silver lining in things and always has a positive spin on things and always shows up in life with a unique enthusiasm about life. By God, that's a positive role model. And that's somebody I would want to play for. Um, it's the opposite of my next guy. Coach, I would not like to play for. We'll get right into that. That's Jimbo Fisher. Um, you know, the first thing 
college football coaches do in a meeting room. The very first thing you get on campus, your freshman year, you go into the meeting room. The first thing they do is they look around the room after they do their introductions or whatever, and they start chastising the human beings that managed and were willing to show up to the meeting room with no paper and no pencil. By God, you came to this room unprepared. You came in here prepared to fail, not looking for knowledge, right? The college football coaches all the time talk all the time about doing the right things, right? About going in there and, and, and doing all the, the rattled off cliches um, and telling you life's about being prepared and, and to set standards and to do all of these things and to live to buy those standards. And then I watch a football coach, Jimbo Fisher, who stood up and didn't have a speech prepared. In fact, for the 20 minutes that he was up there, um, he was just rattling off cliches. We counted 27 of them the other day on the channel. I saw a football coach who did not approach SEC media days with his best foot, for, best foot forward. In fact, he didn't play to the standard at all, nor did he pursue excellence relentlessly. I saw a football coach that talked about such things as controlling what you can control and creating the habits with the chip on your shoulder. That's all he was talking about. All these things, like, again, controlling what you can control, only to stand up there on that podium and mail it in for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? He was allotted all of the time in the world to establish the state of his program, a program, by the way, that went five and seven last year. And he showed up with no notes. I'm not saying you got to go up there and be ready to, to uh, you know, address the free world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you go in front of 18 year olds every single day and talk about standards and talk about pursuing excellence and talking about putting your best foot forward every single day. And then you show up in front of the national media and you mail it in. So I'm supposed to sit into a room or sit in a room for 30 minutes and, and listen to you gallivant on with nothing but cliches and no general purpose, showing up with no general purpose for me. And I had to drone through that for 30 minutes. Could you imagine being a 19-year-old kid having to drone through that for 365 days? Because that's what you are. As a college football coach, you are the voice of the program. You are the fatherly voice that gets played over and over and over again. You are the last bullet point on everything said that day. And, buddy, if you lost me in 30 minutes, I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine how fast you would lose me in, a, in, a, in an eight-month season. Could not. Could not play for Jimbo Fisher. Coach, I was most surprised by. Um, this one's pretty easy for me as well. As well, It was Brian Kelly. Um, I expected, a, a, for lack of a better term, a Yankee prick, to be honest with you. I expected him to feel almost as if, um, you know, he was above this type of thing. That, that's the vibe I got from Brian Kelly over the years watching him, particularly watching him coach football. Super red-faced. Um in media, super uh, blame the players, if you will. You know, call great plays. We just got to execute type vibe. Always felt like if I ever was in his presence, I would get bad vibes from him. It's actually the opposite of what I got. You know, I was expecting him to be quick, direct to the point. Again, almost bothered because that's what I've seen from him in spurts. Um, that's the opposite of what we received. We, I, I received a very genuine human being. Um, I, I saw a, a human being that spoke with purpose. I, ta I saw a human being that was on vacation, uh, like most of these coaches were before SC Media Days, and took the time out of his vacation to make sure that he was studying up and being prepared for his speech, the address of his program. That's what I saw. I saw a football coach that was, you know, had a, had a, 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 a voice to his program, right? Year two. That's what it was all about, year two. How much growth can we have in year two? Um, it's very important to me, again, like we just talked about, it's very important to me to watch somebody win a room like that as a football coach. Football coaches have to win rooms. That's, I mean, it's, more, it's more so your job than knowing the right play to call on fourth and two. Because to be honest with you, if you don't have everything else correct, if the rest of the culture, if the rest of the buy-in, if the rest of you, what you are as the runner and the CEO of that organization, what you are, is not believable, you're not even going to be in a competitive fourth and two to call the right fucking play. You understand? If, if you don't get people to buy in, it's over with. It's absolutely over with. And when I watched Brian Kelly speak, 
And when I surveyed the room after he left, hey, man, Brian, Kelly did a great job. Yeah, no, nah, dude, that, that dude really killed it today. He won the room. He won the room. He has the ability to win a room full of strangers, full of media members who don't know jack shit about football most of the time to an ex- to the level that he does. You know what I'm saying? But he, he got their approval, got them to buy in because, again, that's the job to me. That's absolutely the job to me. Um, let's see. Coach that I think is underrated. Didn't get a lot of buzz this week. Okay, he really didn't. Um, but I, th- I think Zach Arnett's got something. You know, the head coach from Mississippi State, just listening to him speak, one of these guys, 100% prepared, 100% had a mission, 100% had a message that he wanted to convey and conveyed it thusly, right? Conveyed it really, really well. Um, but, you know, I wasn't the only I, I think he's just got a presence. And it, it might be the, the, the short hair, the linebacking background. It might be the intimidating physical presence, whatever it is. He has a – I believe in that coach. I would go to war for him presence. And that's that's important, right? And by the way, I'm not the only person that kind of gets this vibe from Zach Arnett. Sam Pittman went out of his way to make sure everybody knew that Zach Arnett was the right hire. And by the way, I'm a football guy, the film guy over here in the corner, okay? There's also a film guy that coaches your football program, Georgia fans listening to this tonight, and that's Kirby Smart. Have you heard what Kirby Smart's had to say about this Mississippi State defense over the last couple of years? About how difficult it is to play against them, how physical they are, how unique of a, a presentation it is, how hard it is to play against them. Kirby, I know Kirby does a lot of tremendous respect for coaches, but there's a difference between got a tremendous respect for him and I'm fitting to rattle off everything that I love about what this dude does. He does that a lot about that Mississippi State defense. And it's all, it's not all Zach Arnett, but it was a byproduct of what he does. Um, so I thought, you know, he, he did a great job this week, uh, or last, last week did a Zach Arnett. Um, Sam Pittman doing Sam Pittman things. That, that guy's so lovable. I hope that Arkansas is just fit to be tied with that dude, just extremely over the moon happy as they should be, right? Um, and, you know, we, we, we've talked about Billy Napier on this channel already. I, I, want, I want so bad to believe that Florida is going to be a serviceable, serviceable fo- football team for the next two years so that Billy's got a chance to see 2025 and, and, and see 2025 with some opportunistic viewpoints about him. But I don't know if this is going to be the one. I, I don't know if Florida is going to be the job for Billy, but I do think Billy Napier is going to be a successful college football coach. I just think he does the right things. I think he says the right things, but I think he's about two or three years from finding his true identity as a football coach. Cause how could he have one right now? You know, go, go back and look at Kirby smart, 2018, Kirby smart, 2017. He was having a tremendous amount of success, but he sure was in that saving shadow. You know what I mean? We, we hadn't really talked about Kirby being Kirby yet. It was more like Kirby playing Saban's role at Georgia. Maybe one day he'll be Kirby smart. You know what I mean? I think one day Billy Napier will be Billy Napier, and he'll be a great football coach. Don't know if it's going to be at Florida. Um, some player reactions. Okay, obviously we got some players up there at SC Media Days. Hey, by the way, hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribing. Make sure you're in the chat firing off, even though I can't quite see it tonight. Anyways, um, different setup. Been telling you about it. You know – um, a lot of players up there, a lot of players that I've had opinions about already, right? Guys like Joe Milton, guys like Spencer Rattler, Cedric Van Prank, Kamari Laster, Brock Bowers, football players that we know, football players that we're accustomed to. Um, also some football players that I haven't talked to, um, some that I haven't seen in quite a while. We'll start with Spencer Rattler. I remember coming on this channel and telling you a story about Spencer Rattler at the Elite 11 a couple years ago. Um, he was there as a counselor, which means you're kind of there to be a leader. You're kind of there to be a role model. You're kind of there to be a counselor, kind of there as a college student and an athlete, um, there to give advice to young men. And I'll never forget, Spencer was kind of going through the drill, and he was going through the motions, very much so, one of the drills. And Quincy Avery, a quarterback coach that I respect very much so, um, basically told him, like, hey, man, 
do the drill like you would do in a game. Spencer, with his pit vipers on, turned around and goes, hey, but coach, it ain't a game, is it? We ain't playing no game today, are we? And kind of said it like that. I'm like, you know, that's bad vibe. That's that's vibes I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't fuck with. <laughs> you know what I mean? This was before he got benched. This is before he came back against Texas. This is before he transferred to South Carolina. This was before, I guess, the world would say that Spencer Rattler was humbled. And, boy, if that wasn't the complete opposite of what I saw in Nashville this past weekend at SC Media Days, if that ain't a professional, I don't necessarily know what is. Um, he answered every single question with the tone in which you're supposed to, um, with the answers in which you're supposed to. A prime example – he knows that he is not to say anything about the University of Georgia because no matter what he says, it's going to get clipped. I'm telling you right now, I was asking the question with hopes that I could write an article about it. So I asked him, hey, what'd you learn? What'd you learn in that Georgia game? Because y'all got smacked. I didn't say it like that. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. His immediate answer, we got to get better. Is there any particular avenue or area that y'all need to get better at, Spencer? Nah, everywhere. We got to get better everywhere. It wasn't, you know, that game was such and such, or we could do better. We got, we got something coming for him. This, nah, it was straight up coach speak, quarterback speak, professionalism to the T. That's what it was all week from Spencer Rattler. I think he's grown up tremendously. Does that mean, he, he, you know, because he speaks like a grown up and he approaches life like a grown up, does that mean that he's going to play the quarterback position like a grown up? I don't know because he makes a whole bunch of bad decisions. OK, and he turns the, he puts the ball in, in harm's way quite often. And just because you're mature off the field and you speak maturely doesn't mean you make mature decisions with the football, at least to date. He hasn't yet. So we'll have to see that this coming year. But from a personal standpoint, getting to know that human, he's matured tremendously. So I think he deserves not that he gives a shit about my opinion, but people like that deserve some credit when they go through life and, uh, you know, they get knocked down and they, and they find a way to improve upon themselves. Um, speaking of which, Joe Milton, we've talked about on this channel how we're going to kind of debunk the hype, and we will. We will talk about the things that Joe Milton needs to improve upon because there are a litany. Um, but damn, if that ain't a grown man. I, I listened to him speak off in the distance. I was just standing off listening to him. And I, le I learned. I learned about the importance of diction, Okay. My uh, English teacher will be proud that I remembered this word, diction, okay? Basically, the, the, your choice of words, how you choose the words that you choose, that is your diction. Um, I think there's a synonym in there called syntax. Don't really know the difference between the two. Not the point. Okay, Joe Milton's choice of words speak volumes to me. A prime example of this. He was asked, what was it like taking a back seat to uh, Hendon Hooker the last two years. And before the question was finished, he stopped the reporter and he said, I want to stop you. You said, taking a back seat. I don't think of it that way. I think of myself as a passenger on the road on the last couple of seasons. Hmm. Not a back seat. I'm a passenger on this road. 22-year-old, 23-year-old, okay, with – a different kind of thought process than a lot of these young men nowadays have. Just, to, just the changing in the wording. And what does that simplify to me? Or what does that exemplify to me? That exemplifies a little bit about what we were talking about Shane Beamer earlier. I choose to put things in this term. I choose to look at things this way. You're over here in Negativeville, and you can live in Negativeville, okay? But I'm going to choose to be a passenger, not a backseat, uh, you know, I'm not in the backseat. I'm going to choose to look at things like Coach Heupel remaining with Hendon Hooker after my injury as a byproduct of winning. That's what he told me. I said, what did you feel or what was your response to Coach Heupel telling you we're going to stick with Hendon? Well, it wasn't anything I did because I got hurt, first of all. Second of all, they stuck with the results that were winning. And that's what we are here to do. That's what he said. That's what we are here to do. We are here to win. So how can I look at my coach and think negatively about his decision that was most positively impacting winning. What? What? How, how can you do that? Well, because you're selfish like the rest of us. 
The rest of us care about me before we every single time, not Joe Milton, not in front of microphones, not when an opportunity to say things like, well, you know, it, it was tough or, yeah, you know, I, I sulked for a couple of weeks. Whether that be true or not, that's not what he decided to say. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of a football player um, that has gone through some, some growing pains and come out on the other side as a really, really freaking mature adult. And when I hear success stories like that, because that's what that is, that's, that's outside of football, that is life. Okay, when I hear a lifelong success story like that, I want to root for that individual. I want to watch that individual have success because Lord knows he's learned his lessons from life. And I think life needs to give it back to him just a little bit. Just give him a bone every once in a while, um, if you will. So that's what I learned about those two quarterbacks. Um, SVP, strong ass dap game. I mean, we got one of them bro daps. We got one of them mm -mm, bringing in, you give one of them hugs and a little double tap on the back. SVP, you might be watching tonight if you are. I appreciate you, my brother. Um, and Ben Jones, Ben Jones loves you too. <laughs> that that is a that was an interesting relationship to to kind of get some insight on. You know, Ben obviously played at Georgia for Stacey Searles and now is I mean I, th I think he's gonna be a Hall of Famer. I mean I don't know if he'll have Jason Kelsey type voting. I don't know if he'll be first ballot, but I think Ben Jones is worthy of an NFL Hall of Fame look from the offensive line perspective. And listening to that dude talk about SVP and the and the areas of improvement that he has to make, and 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 listening to him kind of compare his career to that of SVP's, it is it is kind of unique and kind of similar in the in the sense that hey, SVP is not. Garrett Bradbury, and I know I'm super deep and nerdy into the offensive line evaluations here, but Garrett Bradbury is one of the most athletic centers to ever come out of college football out of NC State. He's not that. Cedric Van Pran is not that. Cedric Van Pran is far more Ben Jones than Jason Kelsey. Okay, he's not somebody that's going to go out and revolutionize your offense from an uh, athleticism standpoint at the center position. He is a very much so road grading traditional center. Um, he is leadership based. He will remove all pressure and all, uh, you know, anxiety from your quarterback with regards to, uh, you know, play identification and pass protection and things like that. He is very much so a cultural bet far more than he is a physical bet. And he's a physical freak. He's really, really physically talented at six foot three and a half, you know, 305 pounds. He's immensely talented. He's all SEC talented. But he's like first-round draft pick, all-American, all-Pro Bowl, mental leadership guy. And that's exactly what Ben Jones is to me. Um, and, and that's kind of what Cedric's been um, for, for, for three and a half years going on four now at the University of Georgia. So that, that was fun. It's always great to be around Cedric because he's one of those humans. Um, he brings life to the room. He brings joy to the room. Very akin to a Jordan Davis Um kind of very akin to a Nolan Smith, not as outgoing, not as as uh, as bright of a light in the room, but you feel that joy, you feel that love, you feel that presence from Cedric the moment he walks into a room. So that's always palpable. And Brock Bowers, of course, I don't know if y'all y'all probably saw it, but I tweeted out a video of him walking into SC Media Days, and you could see him not hyperventilating, but he was taking some deep breaths, some <sighs> trying to get his mind right. Uh, for what he was about to go do. And this is, again, this is a microcosm of who Kirby Smart is. Kirby Smart will find what you don't want to do, and he will make you do it, and he will do so in a very loving and passionate way. Brock Bowers hates talking about himself. Brock Bowers hates talking in general, I'm pretty sure. He's an introvert by nature. So what do you do to introverts to make them uncomfortable? You throw them to the sharks that are the SEC media days. Um, and I thought Brock did a – a good job of remaining himself and not like portraying some type of fake confidence in front of a camera. He just remained the same introverted Brock that didn't want to be there. And he was uncomfortable and he was short and uh, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. I'm glad he did not bend to the ways of, uh, you know, what people want him to do. Uh, I think, you know, producer Jonathan, I don't know why I call him producer Jonathan, Jonathan, had a, Jay Will had a great point in pre-show meeting today. He said, um, it, Brock Bowers very much so reminds him of the Nick Chubb quote where it was like, you know, how many Lamborghini commercials do you see? You don't. We don't got to sell Lamborghini ads. You ain't got to sell Brock Bauer ads. All right. He going to make enough money 
playing professional football. Learn that this week as well. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. Make sure you're hitting that like, subscribe, all that good stuff. We got one more segment for you guys tonight before we wrap up and head out of here um, for the evening. But it is a very pertinent discussion point, particularly for the University of Georgia, who is oftentimes labeled as RBU. I don't know if you know this, but NFL running backs make on average $1.8 million. Um, I don't mean to make this uh, sound like that's unsubstantial money. Don't get me wrong. It is. It's substantial money until you realize that NFL place kickers on average make $2.2 million. Um, So, yeah, if you heard that right, NFL place kickers make more on average than NFL running backs. Um, And it reminded me of this. Do you remember the scene in Moneyball where Brad Pitt's telling the room of old, you know, scouts like, hey, stop trying to find Jason Giambi. We don't need to find another Jason Giambi. He throws 270 up on the board. We got to find 270 batting average points, right? We got to find 25 home runs. We got to find 90 RBIs. We don't have to find Jason Giambi. Well, that's exactly what's happening with NFL running backs right now. They don't need to pay Jason Giambi. They don't need to pay Todd Gurley. I can get three fifth-round draft picks on my roster, and I can make up the 1,500 yards and 15 touchdowns that Christian McCaffrey is worth. I don't have to find Jason Giambi. I need to find three players that can give me the stats that are Jason Giambi because Lord knows I can't afford Jason Giambi. Okay, that's what NFL uh, general managers are doing right now. This was something that was sparked by a tweet from Matt Miller on Twitter that essentially said, hey, don't draft running backs. Don't pay them. Just cycle through them with undrafted free agents. That's what the NFL Super Bowl winnings, winners are doing. I'm obviously paraphrasing, but you get it. Um, I got to tell you, it's much, much deeper than that. It's not necessarily about finding the three for one, right? It's not necessarily about finding three guys that you can pay the league minimum of $1.8 million instead of paying Christian McCaffrey $10 million. It's a little bit about that, but it's far more about the history. It's far more about the history of really, really bad financial decisions that NFL quarterbacks or NFL general managers rather have made. Did you know that in 2013, Steven Jackson signed a three-year, $12 million contract with the Falcons? Okay, He was heading into his 10th year in the league at that point. 10th year in the league. That annual salary of $12 million, that is currently higher than the annual salary of Najee Harris, DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, and A.J. Dillon. Those are five of the best running backs in the NFL right now. Five of them. Steven Jackson in his 10th year in – 10 years ago, 10 years ago, Steven Jackson was making more money than all of those guys right now. That's bad business. Paying a 10th year running back more, considerably more than what we are currently paying rookies, bad business, not good news, right? Did you know that Todd Gurley, Ezekiel Elliott, Christian McCaffrey, and Le'Veon Bell, those four running backs all rank right now inside the top five for the largest contracts signed to date in NFL league history. Those four names, they have four of the highest five salaries, annual salaries in the history of the sport. Todd Gurley was out of the league within two years of signing that deal. Ezekiel Elliott's uh, yards per carry have declined every single year since signing that deal. His total yards have declined every single year since signing that deal. Christian McCaffrey, since signing his record-breaking deal, has played in 27 of 50 games after going three straight seasons in his rookie contract without missing a single start. Le'Veon Bell has played two more seasons after signing that record deal in 2019, but he hadn't played. He hadn't played since 2021. Played two seasons after signing one of the highest uh, gross salaries and annual salary deals in the history of the sport. Okay? Running backs are complaining for things that they've done to themselves on the NFL level. You want to make sure the next guy continues to get paid. Live up to your contract. Bad business is bad business. If we watch an entire industry continue to make bad decisions, well, we would call those people stupid. That's what we would do. So we're supposed to sit here and feel bad for businessmen making good business decisions and not repeating the bad ones? No, that's not what we're going to do right now. That's not what we're going to do at all. Um, but 
people will sit here tonight and they'll be like, what in the hell does this conversation got to do with college football? Well, I will tell you right now that if your prime money-making years in the NFL at the running back position are after your first contract, well, now that the NIL, the NIL, I sound like an old person. Now that NIL has made its way to college football, guess what you can do? Your prime money-making years have just been extended by four years in the preset, right? We got an opportunity to go make some cash now, okay? And thanks to On3 being so adamant about being involved in NIL discussions, we actually have some credibility to what I've been telling you forever, which is there's a few big spenders um, that ain't quiet about it. All right. And what are the schools that I've been mentioning to you forever about NIL? Right. It's been Tennessee. It's been Miami. It's been Texas a &M, It's been Oregon. It's been USC. It's been Texas. Right. It's all those programs. I've been telling you, hey, these teams spend that money. They spend it like crazy. Well, now we have articles that prove it because these NIL uh, foundations are just running their mouth. They just want to tell people how much money they're spending. So we have it. We have verifiable, credible sources telling us these are the people spending all that money. And I'm here to tell you that the demands at the running back position are not just NFL quarterbacks tweeting because they're mad kickers are making more money. NIL decisions are being made right now and being impacted by the fact that the NFL market is going down. OK, so if my spending money or my earning years are reset by God, we are demanding the most amount of money possible as early as possible right now. If we are a running back, because we are essentially a high school pitcher that after Tommy John, we can't recover right after after we take so many hits as a running back and our wheels are shot, we're done. So we better be making our money as early and as fast as possible. OK, so what are we seeing right now on the recruiting trail from this? We're seeing running backs demand disproportional money, disproportional money. They are getting paid higher per value than any other position because they're demanding. it. OK, and if you don't believe me, go look at where some of the top ranked running backs have committed since the 2022 signing class. OK, if you remember, the 2022 signing class was what I would call the NIL class forever. It was the first signing class to be drastically impacted by the fact that kids can make money when they get to college off their name and their image and their likeness, essentially pay for play. So you go back and look at that 2022 signing class. This was the Texas A&M signing class. They signed the biggest class or the best recruiting class in the history of recruiting, only to have about five or six of those guys transfer out within six months after they got the first down payment. Not to be talked about now, but kind of. OK, so if we pair up top rank running backs with top-ranked spenders on the NIL forefront, we should see some overlap, shouldn't we, right? Well, let's find it. 2022, Relique Brown signs with USC. Now, NIL-based, maybe also an LA kid. Le'Veon Moss, the fifth-ranked running back, signs to Texas A&M in, uh, in 2022. Trevante Citizen signs with Miami, the ninth-ranked running back in 2022. 2023 is where it gets great. C.J. Baxter, Cedric Baxter, number one-ranked running back in America. Great football player. I uh, think he's going to be potentially has a chance to be Najee Harris. Maybe better. Um, signs with Texas. Okay. Signs with Texas over Texas A&M. Right. You get, you get me. Uh, the third ranked running back, Ruben Owens, commits to Texas A&M. So number one goes to Texas. Number three goes to Texas A&M. Number two, Justice Haynes goes to Alabama. Um, don't know if you know, dad played seven years in the league. Uh, dad's also a crypto like multi guy like yeah wasn't even about it right um the sixth ranked running back Dante Dowell goes to Oregon the seventh ranked running back Mark Fletcher in 2023 goes to Miami you look in 2024 this current class number two overall running back Jared Gibson despite the fact that they just signed Cedric Baxter last class Texas so you Cam Davis FSU Kevin Riley Miami fifth ranked running back so you want the proof is right there, okay? Yes, Georgia and Alabama are still landing running backs, but you will see Georgia and Alabama miss on this position far more than they used to, okay? Far more than they used to because those are the two programs that are not doing that. They are not in bidding wars. They are not. We've been telling you this for years now on this channel, and now we have other outlets that are willing to tell you, um, hey, Georgia's recruiting number one in the country, but they're spending at number 12. How? No bidding wars. Not doing it. 
not doing it. You call, say my price went up. They say, have fun. See ya. Au revoir. You know what I mean? That's how it's going at Georgia and Alabama. So you're going to see them miss on running backs because that running back market is going absolutely bonkers. Um, let's close out the show tonight. Uh, here's the deal. I know we've been signing out with like Instagram captions. Um, I always thought it was funny to look at like professional football players accounts and they post, you know, pictures of them scoring a touchdown with, with some goofy, you know, quote, like call me the rat, the way I'm chasing the cheese or I'm steady getting to this bread, no matter the fact that I don't loaf, you know, goofy sayings that, uh, you know, are funny. I was, I was hoping to make you laugh. And, and I laughed. I laughed every single time I did one. Um, I thought it was funny. thought it was a great way to sign out. Um, but I don't think it's meaningful. I don't think something like that is impactful. I don't think with my platform that it is, it is something that I should not necessarily should be doing. It's not like bad or anything. It's just not, it's not impactful. It's not meaningful. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like to, to challenge myself with inner dialogue. I like to challenge myself with seeking knowledge. Um, I like to improve my mental health daily. And if I go through life and all I ever do is educate you guys on football, then I don't know if I use this thing properly. Um, so not that I'm some type of inspirational person, not that, you know, I'm Gandhi, not that I'll have my life in order, but I, I do think, like I said, I, I think my life is in far more order. It's closer to what I'm supposed to be like when I'm seeking knowledge and when I'm, uh, you know, reading and when I'm looking for, for something to impact me, if you will. Um, so at the end of these shows from now on, I, th I think I'm going to give you something that's impacted me or that has, uh, you know, I, I draw strength from or something that just made me smile that day or something that will give you an opportunity to think about where you are in your life or how you can go about improving the same thing. These things do to me when I run across them. Um, so today's lesson, if you will, comes from Nipsey Hussle. For those of you who don't know, Nipsey was a famous hip hop artist. He got his name Hustle from his entrepreneurial spirit. Um, he was actually shining shoes at the age of 11 for $2 and 50 cents a piece. And his daily goal was to make a hundred dollars off of shining shoes. Um, Nipsey always had a hustler spirit. <clears throat> he was always looking for new ways to reach people and new ways to impact people as well as new ways to make money. Um, and before he was shot and killed, Nipsey had opened up his own clothing line and he had actually bought out a famous strip mall in Crenshaw where he grew up. It's actually where he was tragically murdered. But he was a man that was always he always had too much going on. He was always, you know, most people would say overwhelmed or some people would say doing too much or trying too much. Um, and before he passed away, he was on a podcast and he said something that stuck with me and I wanted to relay it to you. He said um, he said this when he starts to feel like, quote, this is a lot or this is too much. He reminds himself that that's what it's supposed to feel like if you're going towards the vision of greatness. That's what it feels like when you're pursuing something or going after the vision of greatness and what that looks like. This shit ain't supposed to be comfortable. It's not. OK, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's supposed to stretch you. It's supposed to be a burden to a degree. So whatever you're pursuing in life, understand what it, whatever that is, whether it's, you know, a new goal in the weight room or whether it's a, a new goal in your in, in your day to day life and in, in your household, whether it's a new goal in your job or whether it's a, a new company that you're trying to start. Understand that when you are pursuing greatness, when you are going after whatever you're intended to pursue in life, it will not be comfortable. It will not be easy. And it is supposed to stretch you. It's supposed to feel like too much. It's supposed to be overwhelming. That's how you know you're in the right spot. So if you're overwhelmed today, understand that you're pursuing something that's greater than you. You're pursuing the right purpose. You're going after something that's worth pursuing. You're going after something that's worth going after. So continue to do it. I love you. We'll see you next time.